we live, we love, we serve. In the Old Testament, it's, it's a rather lengthy passage, so just bear with me. Um, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. I want to begin at the first verse, Numbers 20, beginning at verse 1. The Israelites, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and against Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had died when our kindred died before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went away from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting. They fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron, and command the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Thus you shall bring water out of the rock for them. Thus you shall provide drink for the congregation and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and said to them, Listen, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me to show my holiness before the eyes of the Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord and by which he showed his holiness. Come on, beloved, let's, let's pray. God, we thank you today, and we are so grateful, O oh God, for this time. God, thank you because even on the days we don't quite feel right, you are still present in our lives. You restore us. You heal us. You work on us, O oh God. And God, so often we give thanks for blessings and breakthroughs, but God, sometimes we just thank you for not giving up on us, for continuing to draw us closer to you, to continue to quicken our spirits and enliven our hearts to serve you. Because at the end of the day, oh God, at the end of the day, what we do for you is that which will last. So, God, keep on doing whatever you need to do with us, through us, and in us to get the glory out of us. We love you. We love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, God. And it's in your name we pray. We say amen. Good. Remain standing with me for a moment. I want to read that verse 12. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me to show my holiness before the eyes of the Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Amen. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. You take your seats. Hey, beautiful. <laughs> ah, I want you to just listen to this, this, this sermon today, this talk today, and I, and I thought of a title for it, and, and what I want to talk about briefly is uh, learning from Moses' mistakes. It's about learning from Moses' mistakes. In the book of Deuteronomy, there's a scene where God leads Moses up to the top of Mount Pisgah. He leads him there what seems almost like a taunting moment from God. He takes him to the top of Mount Pisgah, and there he allows him to see the promised land, all of Canaan. The promised land was the land that God had set aside for his people, and it is the land that Moses was leading the people to for that 40-year journey. But because of this scene in Numbers 20, Moses was told neither he nor his brother Aaron would ever enter the promised land because of this scene. 
And so in Deuteronomy, the end of Deuteronomy, he takes Moses to the top of Mount Pisgah. And it seems almost cruel, Ian. He says, basically, look at all of this land. It is a land that your people will inhabit, but you will not. As Moses made his way up to Mount Pisgah, he was guided by the staff that he had had for so long. And I know that as he stood there looking at Canaan, looking at the land he would never inhabit, he had to also think about what that staff meant to him and how that staff in a strange way contributed to the reality that he would not enter the promised land. That staff of Moses was critical to his work. When you go back to the calling of Moses, it is one of the most amazing stories in the Old Testament. And some of us may have heard it in Sunday school. Moses was tending to the flock of his, his father-in-law, Jethro. And while he was tending to the flock one day there in the region of Mount Sinai, what does Moses see? Moses sees a bush that is burning, but not being consumed, not burnt up. He sees this bush, and there's this moment where Moses stops what he's doing to look at this bush that is burning, and I love this part. It says, when God saw that he noticed and paid attention to the burning bush, then God called Moses. He said, Moses, Moses, that scene, that piece in that story of Exodus is so critical that the call of Moses to be the liberator it was because primarily Moses stopped to pay attention what looked very strange. And when God saw him stop to notice what was strange, God then calls him Moses, Moses. He calls Moses, and if you know Moses' story, whether you saw it on TV or read it in the Bible, you know that Moses was on the run from Egypt. He was raised as a prince of Egypt, so to speak, and had killed an Egyptian soldier and was on the run. In 40 years, he lived in Midian, found a wife, got married, had children, and all was well in his life. He had escaped the place that he thought he would be killed in, which was Egypt. He gets to Midian, and for 40 years, things are good. Life is well until that day when he paid attention to the bush. I often wonder, would there's ever a time in Moses' journey did he get mad that he stopped to pay attention to that bush? <laughs> because that bush set everything off of Moses. Moses was there for 40 years and there on that mountain he sees the bush and then when he sees it he hears the voice of God call out to him tells him take off your shoes you're on holy ground and then there he tells Moses something I know Moses did not anticipate he said Moses I have heard the cry of my people I have seen their slavery their captivity I've seen what they've been going through and I'm going to deliver them out of the place of their captivity and guess what Moses I'm going to use you to deliver my people can you imagine what Moses must have felt? Moses begins to think about the possibilities of what God is asking him to do. Go back to Egypt and deliver my people. Tell Pharaoh to what? Let my people go. You know the story. Let my people go. That had to shock Moses because think about it for a second. God comes and gives you this assignment out of nowhere. And God's assignment is to go back to the very place you were trying to get away from. That God wants you to go back to the place that you, for you, has been a place of trauma, a place of pain, a place that you've been trying to get away from. And here comes God with this divine assignment to liberate God's people. And now for Moses, it means revisiting the space and the place that was not only traumatizing, but the very place he was trying to get away from. And you have to imagine Moses is not keen on this. Moses does not want to go. It's like many of us in some ways, when we find ourselves having gotten away from a place we thought was problematic in our lives and then all of a sudden we feel some compulsion to go back to the problematic place the problematic space we will fight against the compulsion because all we see and feel are the memories of what was but not the possibilities of what can be and so Moses resists God he tries he says God listen I, I can't go I can't do it why would you ask me to do this? There's nothing very significant about me. I don't even think the folk will listen to me, let alone believe me. And I know he wanted to add this. And some people might actually recognize me when I go back there. And then maybe all hell might break loose when they realize who I am. I don't want to go. He's like, like who should I tell him sent me? He, God says, well, tell him I am. 
I am. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know anything, but I am. In other words, tell them, my people who have not been worshiping me for 400 years, tell them I still exist. That they don't have to worry about the stories they've heard about me, that I'm going to move in their midst. And he said, tell them I am. Moses, that's not enough. It's not enough for Moses to hear that God is sending him. He says, I'm not qualified. I'm not gifted to do this thing. You have to find somebody else. And then God asks Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses sees he has what? That staff. And God says, throw it on the ground. When Moses throws it on the ground, it turns into a snake. And then God tells Moses to pick it up by the tail. When Moses picks the stake up by the tail, it turns back into staff. This had to mesmerize him because I'm quite sure that never in his time in the yard of Jethro did that staff do anything significant like that. The same staff he'd been using for 40 years now all of a sudden has powers that he never knew about. And that didn't convince Moses. Moses it says, well, God, that may not be enough. And God says, okay, take your hand. Now, Moses has a garment on, a cloak on. He said, take your hand, put it inside the cloak. Moses put it inside. He pulls it out. His hand had leprosy. He said, okay, put it back in the cloak. He puts it back in the cloak. Now, he pulls it out, and it is healed. Notice this, that all the things God does to convince Moses he's the one is not giving God, or rather giving Moses, anything new. He used the staff. He used the garments that he's already ran to show that the power is there. Then he tells him, here's the last sign. This is the one when you read this story, if you choose to read it after today. This is the one that gets me. He said, now, here's the third sign. If the people don't believe the first sign, if you don't believe the first sign or the second sign, here's the third sign. Remember, Moses is having this conversation with God and Midian. And the third sign, he says, listen, when you go to the Nile River, did you get that? He said, when you go to the Nile, get some of the water, pull it out of the, the Nile, and when it hits the ground, it'll turn to blood. You might have missed that. He is in Midian arguing his case why he shouldn't go, but the third sign he's the right one will only come when he gets to the place that God is sending him. That confirmation won't come until you leave. Confirmation won't come until you move. That the confirmation that you are the one, you're in the right place, won't happen, Moses. The final confirmation won't happen if you stay stuck in Midian. There are a whole lot of us who love our Midians. The places of safety and the places of refuge, the places we finally say, I found a place where I can be myself, only to have that place of peace and sanctity disrupted by God who won't let you have peace in the place you thought would be peaceful. He says, when you get to Egypt, because you're going, (laughs) when you get to Egypt, that third sign will be there, get that water to turn to blood. That ain't enough for Moses because he doesn't want to go. I'm telling you, I know what this feels like because i got to be honest. Let me pause for a second. In 2003, when God started making it clear that I needed to leave what I thought was my final place in North Carolina, I'm going to tell you, I had plans, long-term plans to stay in North Carolina because it was good to me. It was good to my family. And when I felt God telling me to come to New York to a place that was worse off than when I was leaving, I resisted. I mean, every moment I told folk that when I go for my interview at First Corinthians, I'm going to act a fool in the interview. And I did. I promise you I did. You can ask any of them who's still there. I acted a fool. I was real. I I got stank. I started arguing with the chair of the deacons. I started arguing with the trustees because I didn't want to go there. Because my thing is after I perform this, if they still want me, this is God. That's what I told myself because I did not want to go. I talked to people in my life, watch this, who I thought would be on my side and see it my way. But everybody I spoke to about moving to New York was like, hey, I think I'll be great for you. I was like, no, I didn't ask you so that you would tell me to go. I asked you so that you would validate what I feel, but not one person validated what I was feeling. Everybody seemed like they was in on this thing with God to get me out of Durham, North Carolina to Harlem, New York. I resisted and thought I could come up with all kind of great excuses. to God. Moses did the same thing. And his last thing, here it was. You got to catch it. God, I can't talk. I can't even speak well. What do you mean sending me to Pharaoh to tell him anything? I got a speech problem. He go, God, can your brother speak? Look at God, quick, fast. 
He didn't pay attention to Moses. Your brother can talk, can he? Yes. He said, okay, we're going to use Aaron. Aaron is going to go speak on your behalf, but here's the key. He said, I'm going to give you the words to speak to Aaron. You're going to speak the words to Aaron, and this is the only time you see this in the entire Bible. Here's what God says. He said, and you'll be like God for your brother. Don't exist nowhere else where God gives somebody permission to be like God. But he tells Moses, go ahead, talk to your brother. You'll be like God to your brother. And he goes. Well, you know the story. Moses and his family uproot. They make their way to Egypt. And then when they get to Egypt, if you know the movie or you read it in the Bible, you get all these plagues that come. Because remember, Pharaoh don't want to let the people go, and Moses wants the people to go. And so God must demonstrate power. And the power comes by way of these 10 plagues when you read it. 10 plagues to come. Now, what you got to get is that the 10 plagues are not for Pharaoh, even though Pharaoh is, is the recipient of the badness of this. But those plagues that God does is for the people of Israel. Why? Because for 400 years, they believed that Pharaoh was the only power so that God had to help them see that the power they thought had ultimate power did not have ultimate power, that God did. So the plagues weren't for Egypt. The plagues were for Israel so they would believe that their God was stronger than the one who held them captive. And so when you go through those 10 plagues, here it is, plague number seven, right? Plague number seven, I love, is thunderstorms with hail and destroying all the crops. Why do I choose seven? Because seven was one in which Moses, in order to make that plague work, it said he took that staff, raised it up, and all of a sudden, the storms of hail began to come and destroy everything. Plague number eight, God tells Moses to do it again. He takes the staff again. He raises it up. And this time, what the hail and the storms did not destroy, locusts come and consume. And then plague number nine, he does what? He raises that staff again, and then darkness covers the region for three straight days. No light, just darkness. Three of the plagues Moses uses directly the what? That staff that is in his hand. Well, let's move forward a little bit in the story. When Egypt finally relents and let Israel go, you know the story. I'm going to say it again. You either saw the movie or you read it. When they're leaving Egypt and they're headed into this wilderness to get to the promised land, there's a problem. There's a Red Sea. They get to the Red Sea and all the people do what? They begin to complain, man, you brought us out here to die. We could have died in Egypt. Why did you bring us out here? They quarrel and complain to Moses. Moses goes to God and God says, don't worry about it. Go in front of the Red Sea and do what? Take that staff, lift it up. And when you lift up that staff, I promise you, you're going to see some things happen. Moses gets to the Red Sea, he raises the staff, and the sea starts to part. And the people begin to cross, and they make their way across the Red Sea. And the sea is still open. And then what happens? You know the story. Egypt tries to follow through, but when they try to follow through, the sea closes up and kills all the Egyptian shoulders. That's a lesson right there. Listen, the path for me ain't the path for you. And just because the path for me was a breakthrough don't mean it's going to have the same impact on your life. That's why you got to learn to trust God for your own way and stop trying to copy and follow other people's path because their path led to success. Their path was for them. And I know sometimes it gets tempting to want to follow other people's paths, especially when you see other people's success. But it just may be that their success ain't for you. That God has something significant and significantly special for you. And you got to trust the path that God put you on. Because again, what works for me might not work for you. They get through the Red Sea. They get to a place called Meribah. And when they get there, the people begin to get mad again. Why? There's no water in Meribah. No water. The people complain to Moses, and this is the cycle. The people complain to Moses, Moses complains to God, and God shows away. Same process. The people complain to Moses, Moses complains to God, and God tells Moses, listen, gather the elders and take your staff. He says this, go to the rock in Meribah. He says this, and this is the part most people don't get. God said, I'll be standing on the rock. And when you strike the rock, most folk don't see God's presence. He said, but when you strike that rock, water will come. Moses strikes the rock. Water comes. Everybody's happy. But here's the key. Forty years later is where you get our, tra our scripture today. Numbers 20. Forty years after water came from the rock, what happened? 
that generation faded, they died, and they get right back to the same place in Meribah again, and the same tactics. They complain to Moses, Moses complains to God. Now, here's a deep thing. They get to the same place their mother and their grandmothers had been before. When they get to the same place their mothers and fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers had been before, they repeat the same pattern of complaining. What does that mean? Let me pause for a second. It indicates something that you can't afford to do. When you know what God has done in your life and you have a history of what God has done in your life, tell your children what God has done. Let the people know what God has done so that they know that the reason why I got where I am is because of God. The reason why we made it through that jam was because of God. So that when they get to the same place and they experience the same thing, they learn to do what? Trust in God the same way. What does that mean? Clearly, the people of the former generation did not communicate this narrative to their children so that when their children got back to this place again, they complained the same way. You have to be willing to tell your children, your family, families, how God has moved in your life. And I know sometimes it's not popular to talk about those things, but if that is how you have been sustained and kept, you ought to share the story of how you know. If it had not been for God in this season in my life, if it had not been for God at this moment in my life, and I have no clue where I would be, tell them that. But they didn't tell their children, so their children repeated the same thing. So they complain, they cry out. And Moses does the same thing, too. You would have thought he would have learned. He goes to God, and he says, God, why did you bring me here? Forty years. He's still talking about, why did you bring him here? Why did you have me do this? And God said, here's what I want you to do. Take the staff. Go down to the rock again. He said, this time, though, watch the bait and switch. Don't hit it. Talk to it. And when you speak to it, the rock, here's a love the language, will yield it's water. Can you think about that? He said, go down with the staff. Don't hit it this time. Speak to it. Moses has been leading for 40 years. He's had some battle victories. He's seen some powerful things. But this is what happens sometimes. Even when you trust God, when you've had a lot of successes, you start confusing you and God sometimes. You start thinking that you were the architect of that moment. Moses goes, here's what God says, and Moses comes out to the people. Look at the scripture. I read it. Now he big. Moses like, listen, you rebels. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure we come some creative names today, you know. <laughs> Moses like, he used rebels. Okay. Listen, you rebels. Because he got an attitude now, right? Because he's been dealing with this for a long time. They always complaining. And Moses said, and here's the problem. He said, should we get water for you? Ain't this deep? Moses, who knows it's not him, said, should we now get water for you? You see that move? It's a fine line between acknowledging God and being caught up in delusions of grandeur. Should we? That was a good timing. I wish we, I hope we recorded that. That was good. That was like, like movie timing. I struck a nerve. That was good. That was good. You can't repeat that if we try. Man, that was good. Man, I want to say it again. <laughs> Moses loses himself in his accomplishments and the success he had with God and start thinking it was about him. It was like, you know, should we do this for you? Well, Moses goes out after talking a little noise and he goes and he hits the rock once. Nothing happens. That should have been an indication of Moses. But Moses is like, look, this staff is good. Boom, hits it again. Ah, water comes. Something must be off. But the water comes. And just like 40 years before, what happens, Arden? The people are happy. We got our water and everything is good. And then God comes in and says to Moses, what have you done? He said, watch this. Why didn't you trust me? Why didn't you trust me? Why didn't you, watch this, give the people a chance? It says holiness, to see my holiness. Now, holiness just means set apart. Because I know in church, we've made holiness mean all these things about, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. No, holiness means set apart. Why didn't you give the people a chance to see how set apart I am, how different I am? But why? God said, because of what you did today, you 
nor your brother are entering the promised land. Well, what did Moses do that was so bad? I mean, the brother was leading the people, Kurt, for 40 years. And you tell me that after 40 years of working and dealing with these rebels, that I can't even get in the promised land because of one thing? It wasn't just the one thing, though. God said, you didn't trust me. What do you mean? He didn't trust you. Well, here it is, and I'll be done. Because these are the things we got to learn from Moses. The first thing is this. Moses put too much faith in that staff just because it had worked before. You got to get that part. I mean, it had worked before. I mean, think about it. 40 years, that staff was working. That staff parted some Red Seas. It, it bought some plagues. It bought water from a rock. And if you read the story, that staff being lifted caused him to win some battles and some victories. I mean, my God, the staff is there. He put too much faith. Oh, here it is. When you start putting too much in the tools that you have rather than the one who has gifted you, he started thinking the tool was the thing. That it had to be the staff because he had victories. Why wouldn't you? If this thing worked before, why wouldn't you put faith in it? The problem is sometimes you can put faith in it and lose faith in God. Because those things have done what you need them to do. I know all of us in here can testify that we've had those moments where we've done certain things certain ways. We've repeated certain things certain ways and it was successful. We tell ourselves, why change? Why shift? If this thing has worked for these years, why shift? Why change? Why try to do something new? Why step out and try to change my life and shift things if this has yielded success? Here's what you got to know. All success does not mean permanent success. That you got to get to a point in your journey where you trust God for what? New mechanisms and new techniques. And don't be romanticized and lulled to disobedience because you had past success. Give God a chance to show you what God can do. Because the truth is, when you put your hands in God's hands, here's how we learned in Sunday school, every round we go higher and higher, which means that if I trust God consistently, it doesn't even matter about the success I've experienced in the past. I got to believe that there's more waiting for me. Why limit myself to what I know and miss what I've never seen? Why be so fixed on what I've had so long and miss what I could get right now in this season? I hope I'm helping somebody here today because you may be in that space and place where it's time for a shift from your old ways and a shift from your old mechanisms and a shift from your old tools to do something new. And you're resisting doing something new because you're afraid you won't have the same success. That means you're starting to think that it's about the success and not the journey. You see, that's why when you came here, you heard Pastor Dad say, our journey partners. Why? Because this life is a journey. And it's a journey where you discover things about yourself and you discover things about God. And Moses shows us this, that sometimes if you put too much faith in the tools that have yielded success, you miss new opportunities. First thing you got to learn. But then just as I say that, I also want to say, man, I can't be too hard on Moses for this one reason. And this is what is missed in this story. I understand why Moses would put so much faith in that staff. Because if you know the story, check this out. Moses knew the staff longer than he knew God. Remember, when God met him on Mount Sinai, he asked him, what's in your hand? Which means that Moses had a long relationship with the staff than he had with God. And sometimes those long relationships with familiar spaces make you hesitant to enter new phases. I hope I'm telling somebody something today you need to hear. I can testify to that. Sometimes the familiarity of what is old will cause you to miss what can be new. Even if the old is problematic. Even if the old, no, let's go this way. Even if you've outgrown the old, Knowing what the old represents makes you afraid of moving into the new. I know there's some of us in here today who can find some good reasons why holding on to the old makes sense. Because even if the old is problematic, it's a problematic thing that you know. You've learned to navigate the problematic space. You've learned to navigate the problematic people. You learn to navigate the problematic issues. And yeah, I know it ain't the best, but at least you know it. Boy, I know I'm talking to somebody today. It may not be the best thing for me anymore at this point in my life, but I mean, 
It's familiar. I mean, it doesn't always get me to where I need to be, and it's not part of the ultimate plan I have for myself, but I mean, it's comfortable. Have you ever made a decision for comfort over courage? Have you ever made that decision? Well, you chose comfort instead of being courageous because, man, courageous was calling you to places you weren't familiar with. And so when courage was calling you to go here, you was like, nah, comfort might have you beat a little bit today. And I know we've all made those decisions when we had to face comfort versus courage. And the thing about comfort, again, is you know courage, you don't know where courage is going to take you. And that's why courage requires trust in God in that moment. Because when you go away, you've never been and do a thing you've never done and you're becoming a person you've never become. The only thing that's going to help you navigate that space is trust. Not just in God, but trust in the journey, trust in the process. Moses knew the staff more than he knew God. Therefore, he put more trust in that thing because it was the easy thing to do. In other words, I told people after the pandemic, I had friends of mine who are pastors, and I'll be done in a few minutes, who were like, boy, we got to get people back in the church. It was like, man, we, 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 we struggling. Nobody want to come to church. We want to come to the building. And I told them, I said, listen, if I was in the past, I'd be home watching too. I mean, I might come to church once or twice a month, but I'd be home. Why? Because it's hard to compete with convenience. Man, if I'm at home and can roll over and turn on the TV or my laptop and watch service, instead of getting dressed and making my way down, driving to get somewhere, yeah, I'm choosing convenience. It's hard. But sometimes convenience is satisfying, but other times where it's not. Because there's experiences you can miss because of convenience. Opportunities that you can miss because of convenience. And places you can miss experiencing because of convenience. So Moses makes that decision. When he gets out, he hits that rock twice, even though God told him to speak. And then God says, what? And I'm done. He says, you didn't trust me. You didn't give the people a chance to see how unique I am. What do you mean, God? And I hope this helps somebody here today. And I can speak about this from a personal space. You, you, you ever pray about something to God and it doesn't come, wait, it doesn't manifest the thing you've prayed for, right? But, but even though the thing you prayed for didn't happen, George, you've experienced a bunch of success. Even though the thing you prayed about hasn't manifested. You, you get to a point where the thing, your struggle, let's call it that. Let's call it your issue. Your issue, your struggle is not resolved, but then in the midst of it not being resolved, that thing you really wanted to see done or that thing you've been wrestling with within you, that thing you've been struggling with, you haven't seen it come to pass. You haven't seen the change, but in the midst of it, you've seen success. Are y'all with me? Watch this. You've seen success, but you've never really seen that issue that you really struggle with, dealt with. And here's the deep part. Most folk will never see that issue. They will never know your issue because they see your success. And then you get to a point where your success can cover your issue because you let your success be the thing you present, but not your struggle. You let the success be the thing that people see, and they don't know. They don't know that sometimes when you're by yourself at home, that there's nobody there, and you cry yourself to sleep, and though there are many people who desire and wish they had your life, they don't know that issue. They don't know that thing you're struggling with. And so you do a good job also, and you got you to be honest, you do a good job of masking the issue, covering the struggle. And you start buying into the narrative, well, maybe the issue ain't that serious. Maybe the problem that I'm wrestling with ain't that critical. And so you start thinking, you know what, let me put that to the side and, and let me focus on my successful spaces. But deep down inside, there's some part of you that wish God actually spoke to that thing. And then you begin to wonder, God, why won't you move on my issue? Why won't you move on my struggle? Because I see you've been doing amazing things in my life because I couldn't be where I am without you, God. But this thing that I've been fighting with. This thing that I've been struggling with, this thing that I've been having a hard time with is the one thing that I keep coming back to and I can't get away from it because even though there have been other things I've experienced and I can't let other people know that there's still this issue and struggle because I told you, you create a whole persona connected to your success. You become a character in your own story. 
And you begin to let people see the characters, not character, because most of us have more than one character we've created. Especially we don't want people to see what our struggle is. And then all of a sudden, God shows up one day, taps you on the shoulder, and says, I ain't forgot about your issue. I ain't forgot about it. And here's the key, not that God forget, but are you really ready to have that thing dealt with? Are you really ready for God to move on the thing you've prayed about secretly but not talked about publicly? Are you really ready for God to come in and disrupt all the things that, perceive, that are perceived as great and good but this one issue? That's what God did there in Meribah. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Well, I'm glad some of y'all asked. Here it is. You remember one of the reasons Moses felt that he could not do this is he couldn't talk. He couldn't speak. And for 40 years, God let him not really talk. Now, what he didn't realize that the whole time when he said he couldn't talk, God said, okay, I'm going to talk through you. You're going to talk to Aaron. So he missed how God was playing with him at the whole time. No, you're gonna, I'm not going to talk to Aaron. The one who can't talk, you're going to talk to Aaron. I'm going to talk to you. You talk to Aaron. You'll be gone for Aaron. But here's the thing. God, Moses said that was his thing. He couldn't speak. That was his deficiency. And for 40 years, God never dealt with it. And Moses probably thought, hey, I'm good. I can live this life. I've had some success. But Moses didn't realize what God was doing. That scene I read in Numbers 20 was never about the complaining people. It was about helping Moses overcome the thing he thought was his deficiency. You've been using that staff for 40 years and it has been good, Moses, but watch this. Take it with you because I want the people to know that the tool ain't the power. Take it with you. Go down to that rock one more time, but this time what? Don't hit it. Speak to the rock and it will yield it's fruit. You need to understand this. There's not one person in here today who believed that you can get water from a rock. But somehow, God believed that Moses, if you open your mouth, you will cause that rock to release what is present. I hope you get this. That when you speak to it, things will begin to happen that will assault your imagination. If you open your mouth and declare it, it shall be. I hope somebody's getting this today. There are some things in your life that will not until you begin to open your mouth and put it into the atmosphere. There's some things that won't materialize until you speak to your situation and speak to your crisis and believe that it will turn around. And more than that, there are people waiting on you that you do not know who will become activated by your audacity, who will become empowered by your courage, that when you begin to open your mouth and speak to this universe about your life, get ready. To see what happens. Don't be afraid to open your mouth and declare what will be. And don't get to the point to say, oh, Pastor, I got to see it before I can say it. No, say it and then you'll see it. Speak it and it will materialize, beloved. That's all you have to hear today. Moses made mistakes, but we can learn from them today. God said, why didn't you trust me? I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of things I've heard for God in my life. 53 years I've heard, but I pray I never hear God say that. Why didn't you trust me? Why didn't you trust that I see you? Why didn't you trust that I hear you? And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, when you're waiting on God to deal with that issue, it can be tough. It can be hard. But you still have to trust God. Because what I discovered in my journey is that when it is your time, it is your time. And can I tell you this I've learned? If it's your time, there's nothing you can do to stop it. When it's your season, when it's your moment, you can't stop it. That's the season you might need to lean into it. Yeah, yeah. We can all look at the things we might have done, the mistakes we've made, we might have made, but 
that doesn't negate or stop God from being who God is. There will come a day without your permission, here's the key, where God will be ready to heal you. Heal you from that thing, from that hurt, from that pain, from that experience, from that trauma, from that moment. And when God comes to heal and God comes to deliver, don't be so caught in what you perceived as the good that you miss what God is about to do. Why? Because God has not forgotten about you. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've experienced. God has not forgotten. God still sees the person that no one sees. I know there's a bunch of us in here today that if people knew the things we really wrestle with, they would look at us differently. If people really knew the issues we, we fight through. See, sometimes we come into these formats and we praise God and we shout hallelujah and we worship. And people don't understand what it took for us to get to the place to say hallelujah. What it took for us to get to the place we could actually come into a worship experience and actually honor God. They have no idea what it took for some of us to get here just today. What you had to bypass within you. What you had to get around within you. To get to a place where you could say, God, have your way over my life. When was the last time you said that to God? God, have your way. And can I really give you some courageous words to say? And you'll know when it's time to say it. That's when you stand before God, no matter where you are. It could be here today. It could be when you get home. When you then say, with that issue, that thing, or those things, where you say, God, I am ready. I'm ready to be better. I'm ready to grow. I'm ready to be who you're calling me to be. I'm ready. I spent enough time doubting myself. I spent enough time second-guessing myself. I spent enough time beating myself over the head. God, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. How many of you can say that today, honestly? You've been through some things, but you're saying, God, I am ready. I'm tired of the way I've been going. I'm tired of how I've been moving. And I know people think that I'm good and people think that everything is great in my life because it looks like I got everything that everybody else would want, but they have no idea. So I'm ready for you to deal with me in that space, with that issue, with that thing. I am ready. Do me a favor, stand on your feet today. And I want us to pray. I want us to pray. And if you're here today, you want to come up to pray, you can. But here's what the call I'm making for. Those of you who are here today, I need you to be honest and serious today. You know what that thing is. You know what you've been wrestling through. And, and you've been asking God to move, right? You've been saying, God, come on, I need you to do X, Y, Z. I need you. But the one thing you haven't said to God is what? I'm ready. Because although you've been asking for it and asking for it, you actually learn how to be comfortable in certain spaces that don't require you to be ready. But now maybe you're in that place where you are ready for God to work in that place and space within you that you know you have to deal with to get to this new season in your life. So if you're here today, beloved, you're ready for God to do that work. I want you to come up. We want to talk. And nobody has to know what the issue is. But don't be ashamed. And don't say, I'm going to wait for somebody else to come. That's the worst thing to do. You got to make up your mind today. I'm going to be one to set this off. And I'm going to come today. So no matter who you are, where you are, just make your way down. If, if you're in that season where you're saying, God, come on, I'm, I'm ready. Now, here's the thing. I don't want you to make it sound like I, I got you up here. You can move across. Let me make some room. Right? When you say I'm ready, when you say I'm ready, 
don't then try to negotiate with God and be like, I'm ready, but this is how I think it should look. This is how I would like it to look. Because I know I've done that before. God, I'm ready to go to the next phase of my life. But listen, listen, don't disrupt what is right now. See, because when you say I'm ready for God, you're not just saying, saying that, God, I'm ready for you to deal with this thing. What you're saying is, God, I'm ready for you to deal with it any way you see fit to get me where I need to be. And here's what I can tell you from my own experience. Sometimes when you say I'm ready, you don't realize you're saying this when you're saying I'm ready. But when you say I'm ready sometimes, you're saying, God, I'm ready for disruption. God, I'm ready for discomfort. I'm ready, oh God, to shake some things off of me. How about this? I'm ready for a few funerals in my life. Some things I need, well, some things that have been dead that I've been carrying too long. And it's time to bury some of those things. Because part of the problem is, the reason why some of us have a hard time moving into the new season, because you're carrying too much dead weight. So God, I'm ready. No matter how this looks, and it's, I know it's rough. It's rough. I'm, I'm not, I don't even make it seem easy. I'm ready. If it means I got to cry a little bit, I'm ready. If it means I may face days that seem difficult, but sometimes what seems difficult is only God preparation. I'm ready. How about this? God, I'm ready even if it means moving me out of spaces that I felt comfortable in, around people I've been comfortable with. I'm ready. Because you know this. Why are you ready? Because I can no longer go forward this way anymore. I'm at that place where I can say, God, I cannot move forward like this anymore. I'm tired of pretending. I'm tired of asking. I'm tired of putting on the mask. I'm tired of my disguises. I am tired. And I'm tired of crying myself to sleep and nobody sees because I cover up real well in the morning. I'm tired of camouflaging my hurt. I am ready. For this season, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Come on, beloved, let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you, God, for this moment. Thank you, God, for this time. Thank you, God, for reminding us that, like Moses, oh God, you haven't forgotten about the things we struggle with. And I know, oh God, we've been journeying with you and we've had some amazing times. But God, what gives me joy is knowing that you haven't forgotten. You haven't forgotten the things that sometimes hold us back and keep us from showing up as our best selves. So God, we come now, some have come now, oh God, declaring our readiness. Because the truth, oh God, many of us desire the arrival. It's the journey that terrifies us. So God, give us confidence along this new journey. Give us strength along this new journey. But how about this, oh God? Don't give us strength. Remind us how strong we already are. Because the truth is, oh God, you've given us everything we need to be who you've called us to be. We don't always lean into who we are. So God, thank you. God, sometimes with trepidation and sometimes with hesitation and even with trembling mouths, we say, God, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to move forward. For God, you make all things new. And God, we're ready. For whatever that newness looks like, we just know we can't go back. We cannot go backwards. So we declare part of our readiness is not to be stuck where we are, but knowing you walk with us, we will move forward. We will move forward. We will not let fear have its way with us anymore. We will not let fear win anymore. We will move forward because part of our readiness is also ready to go. However that looks. So God, thank you today. God, touch everyone who's come here today in a significant way. Touch them, oh God. Remind them, O oh God, who you've called them to be. And, O oh God, how you do not give us spirits of fear, 
but love, power, sound minds. And God, we will move in that love, move in that power, and move in the fullness of our sanity, believing and trusting in you. Because we trust you, God. We trust you. So God, have your way. Have your way. And what we will do is get out of the way and let you, oh God, be God by yourself. We love you. This is our prayer. In your name we pray. And we say amen. 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 Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord a hand clap of praise on today.